Fanny Crosby. I got the impression in our women in ministry class the day this assignment was being solidified that most of us simply went to Google and put in something along the lines of influential women in the church as our starting point. Since I'm trying to stay current on trends, I decided to hop onto the infamous and hotly charged chat GPT program and see how I could harness artificial intelligence for this project. I have a love-hate relationship with ChatGPT, as it's helped me in creating some incredible therapeutic plans for my adult son who has autism. I also see that here in the fall of 2023, it is still in its infancy and that our collective human voices have the ability to teach the AI what it is we want it to know. To that end, I embarked upon a series of prompts to lead both myself and whatever technological system the internet is evolving into on a journey to meet a woman that every Christian should know the name of, Mrs. Frances Van Alstine Crosby. If you're not familiar with Fanny Crosby, your heart may be through the mighty pull of melody. The types of melodies that flood memories and cultivate emotions the way a stream of sunlight through a piece of stained glass early on a Sunday morning does. For me, the memories of hardwood pews with Bibles and hymnals tucked neatly behind each, next to little white envelopes for tithes and short, sharpened pencils come to mind. The smell of spearmint gum from my Grammy's purse that she always had to help ease my inevitable car sickness on the long drive home from the Assemblies of God Church that was the site of most of my Sunday school years. The sweet, gentle singing of the most wonderful voices crying out, This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Franny Crosby penned the words to that famous hymn, Blessed Assurance, 150 years ago. A dear friend who loved Fanny's poetry had invited her over to see if the music of a new song she had written would say anything to Fanny. Upon hearing the melody, she simply began uttering the now emblazoned in church music history hymns lyrics out loud. After learning that she had written a piece of music that has such a tangential pull on our hearts when it is included in special worship services today, I decided to find out if she had written any other famous worship songs. Shockingly, I discovered that she's personally responsible for upwards of 9,000 hymns and gospel songs that have been published worldwide. I became deeply intrigued and had to learn more about the type of woman that could single-handedly bring so much worship to our churches and how. How is it that her story is one I have never heard before now? Fanny was born in upstate New York in 1820 to doting parents. Shortly after birth, she developed an eye infection while the local doctor was away. Her parents, desperate to help their daughter, enlisted the help of a traveling man that claimed to be a doctor. He applied hot compresses to the infant's eyes, which did ease the infection, but irreparably damaged her corneas. Baby Fanny became blind from the careless act of a traveling charlatan at the age of six weeks old. Her father succumbed to pneumonia four months later. This left her mother Mercy a widow to find work, and Fanny was in the gentle care of her grandmother Eunice. It was during this time that Fanny was read the works of Milton and Shakespeare by day and the Bible by night. Fanny loved the Bible reading times and would often ask her grandmother to tell me the story of Jesus. The 1800s educational system was not equipped to teach children with any type of disabilities. Even though Fanny was exceptional in many ways compared to her peers, teachers would often exclude her or ban her to cover up their own inadequacies with educating the special needs populations. She began praying at the age of eight every single night for a place she could go to learn just like other children. Her mother had always held hope that Fanny's blindness was only temporary and eventually took her to a surgeon named Valentine Mott to see if he could restore her sight. He concluded that nothing could be done, and it is told that as they left his office, Fanny heard him sigh, Poor little blind girl, which inspired her to pen her very first poem. Oh, what a happy child I am. Although I cannot see, I am resolved that in this world, contented I will be. Fanny spent a lot of her childhood simply memorizing Bible verses to cure her boredom with the lack of stimulation at school. 
In 1835, the New York Institute for the Blind opened and Fanny applied. This was the answer to her nightly prayers. At 15 years old, she was accepted and went to study there for 10 years until she was eventually offered a position to teach there herself. The New York Institute for the Blind was such an innovative educational concept that many dignitaries would often visit. Each visitor was presented with printed copies of the dozens of poems that Fanny, the blind girl, would write while studying at the Institute. During her tenure attending and teaching there, she met and befriended many high-profile politicians, including President Grover Cleveland. He would visit her and walk the grounds arm in arm to hear her poetry and transcribe it for her. She went on to become an outspoken political activist, advocating for educational rights for the blind. She was the first woman to ever be asked to speak in the United States Senate, and she would often perform poetry recitations for members of Congress and President Polk, all while still faithfully attending the Sixth Avenue Baptist Church and serving as a missionary, deaconess, and lay preacher. It was not until she turned 30 years old that Fanny tells of her great conversion of faith. Even with a strong Christian upbringing, Fanny never saw her relationship with Jesus as anything more than doing all the right things. One day she had what she calls a revelation, in which she saw a dear friend dying from the cholera pandemic. That, paired with her own brush with death in surviving that same pandemic in 1849, brought Fanny to a point of complete surrender to Christ. After this, Fanny would go on to write more than 9,000 hymns throughout her career. Many of them use one of the 50-plus pen names that publishers insisted she use in order to keep the public happy with new content. To this day, the vast majority of American hymnals contain her work. She was a prolific writer that always brought God into her creation. She was known to compose her lyrics completely in her head, working on upwards of 12 songs at a time until each one was complete, and then she would sit and recite them verbatim to an amanesis. She often wrote from personal experience right on the spot as inspiration would hit. While reciting poetry at a reading she had been invited to give at a state prison, she noted that many of the prisoners were interrupting her reading by calling out to the Lord to not pass me by. Their voices hung on her ear until she wrote the words to Pass me not, O gentle Savior. This led to her passion work with the poor and destitute. While Fanny published thousands of songs, she was only paid one or two dollars per song, with all royalties often going directly to the composers of the music. This was plenty to live on, but Fanny wanted to be known for her work as a rescue missionary. She gave away anything that was not necessary and lived in meager abodes in the areas of town where homelessness was most rampant. Some described her as having a horror of wealth in which she rarely accepted money for speaking engagements and what little she did earn, she nearly immediately gave away, often being quoted as saying that from the first time she got a check for her poetry, she made a commitment to open her hand wide to those that needed assistance. For three decades, she traveled and worked with the Young Men Christian Association, Skid Row Missions, and used her philanthropic, political, and socialite connections to bring about civil changes and attitudes towards the poor. She leaned heavily into the concept of abstinence from alcohol after seeing the ravage effects it had on the many people she would counsel on the streets. There is so much more of her life to be told, yet upon her death in 1915 at the age of 95, she had a meager headstone that simply read, Aunt Fanny, she hath done what she could. It is this meager stone that visually captures the humility with which Mrs. Fanny Crosby lived her life, seeing her disability not as a hardship, but rather a blessing through which she would have access to God in ways no other chosen child of his would. <laughs>